Hello folks. Um, welcome to SECPA. SECPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the land of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nations of Alberta Region 3. And we pay respect to their past, present and future cultural heritage, beliefs and relationships to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the past ways and present injustices that can be re reconciled. SACPA is also very thankful for the continuing support we receive from the University of Lethbridge, Shaw Spotlight and the Lethbridge Herald. Today for our special session, we're very happy to have with us Dr. Esther Tailfeathers. Um, before I go on with the introduction, we're going to watch a brief video by Maya Tailfeathers. This is home, Ghana, otherwise known as Kainai, or the Blood Reserve. Nestled in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, Kainai is the largest reserve in Canada. Beginning in 2014, fentanyl flooded the illicit drug trade on the reserve. This new reality has forced our community to approach addiction in radically different ways. It's like you can name the statistics, you can name all of the ways that the treaties have been broken um, and all of the ways that settler colonialism uh, violently affects us every day. But it's like people just kind of dissociate from it. They, it it's people are desensitized. Um, right. And so ultimately, I, you know, I wanted to humanize these stories, um, especially with like, you know, the opioid crisis is something that's, or the drug poisoning crisis is now impacting people across the country. And so the issue of harm reduction um, and the issue of, of just treating drug and alcohol users with with dignity and respect is it's it's a really common conversation across the country mm -hmm. um and so i wanted to be able to humanize the people who are impacted the most which is which is the people who are drug users themselves and then also their family members and loved ones um and so often with my community in particular there was this just i, I guess just so many problematic representations of my community that were um, that were presented through a lens of tragedy and trauma and um, presenting our people uh, as though we're constantly in a place of deficit, um, which is true on some levels, but I wanted to be able to present the public um, with a portrait that that wasn't that that was a portrait of the community that I know and love um, and so I wanted to honor the strength and the dignity of my people um, and to do so with love and compassion and, and, and respect which are are some of our core teachings and that's how we've survived genocide that's how we've gotten to where we are is through um, is through those those core principles of of, of who we are as, as Blackfoot people. And so I wanted settlers to be able to see this film and understand that there are so many people within my community who are working so hard for, for solutions with very few resources, but also to recognize that our people are so uh, capable of doing this work on our own. And we have been doing this work on our own for a very long time. Um, but as a further to that, as a community member, I just am so immensely proud of where I come from and, and the people that I come from and and I love my community more than anything. And so I wanted to be able to um, give my community the gift of of, of that, of, of, of honoring who we are as a people and uh, and um, and documenting this this really important moment um, that I think is going to uh, to really help change the dialogue around um, addiction or substance use disorder and indigenous people in this country because it's a it's a very very complicated and um, often divisive topic within our communities and I, I certainly hope that in providing a story that's rooted in love and respect 
um, for our people that we're able to, to at least push the conversation a little bit further. How do I tell stories in ways that don't replicate these common, commonly accepted uh, extractive forms of, of filmmaking and storytelling. Um, you know, my, my film is a co-production with the National Film Board. Um, and one of the reasons I decided to make it a co-production and become the majority co-producer was because I wanted to care for my community's stories. Um, if it's a full NFB production, it means that that institution essentially owns those stories. All of them go into the archives at the NFB. Um, and that is really troubling for me as somebody who has documented, uh, I think at least a hundred people participated in this film in front of the camera at some point. And so wow. there's like 150 hours of footage from my community um, of, of stories that don't necessarily belong to me. Like just because I'm from that community, just because I'm the filmmaker, doesn't mean that I own the rights to those stories. Um, and so it was something I had to really carefully consider, like what, what does it mean to work with this large institution that's government funded, um, and then ultimately have those stories be owned by the institution. And I think that's something that most indigenous filmmakers are, are, are consistently having to navigate is like, how do we engage in relationships with Canadian institutions in a way that doesn't allow them to continue to like consume and control our stories um and so yeah it's it's i haven't figured it out necessarily but i'm i'm it's very much a part of my process just trying to to navigate how to tell stories in an ethical way and how to first and foremost be accountable to my own community because <laughs> i don't get to just walk away at the end of the day History marks the Bloods as some of the fiercest, strongest people there ever was. And I want us to get to that point again. I'm happy for you. We have a Blackfoot word that's called Gimma Bi Bitsin, which means giving kindness to each other. And that means also compassion for those who are suffering. It's an amazing thing that they've done. And in my eyes, they're heroes. <laughs> This is home. Excellent. That was a wonderful film by Maya. Um, Esther, we're so happy to have you with us today. Dr. Esther Tailfeathers was born and raised on the Blood Tribe Kainai First Nation in Southern Alberta. She graduated from the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and completed her family medicine residency at the University of Alberta. Esther has worked with many First Nations, among them the Emergency Department of the Blackfeet Reserve in Montana, the Blood Tribe Reserve for almost 20 years, and in North Alberta community of Fort Chippewan. She's most proud of organizing a relief mission to Haiti after the earthquake in 2010, leading a team made up of Blood Tribe paramedics, nurses, and healthcare workers who took care of more than 2,000 patients during their relief efforts. Most recently, Dr. Tailfeather has focused on the Blood Tribe's response to the opioid crisis, including harm reduction and treatment, and addressing the upstream determinants of health. Dr. Tailfeather is currently the Senior Medical Director, Provincial Indigenous Wellness Corps at the, the Alberta Health Services. Thank you so much for your time here today, Dr. Tailfeather, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Annalise. Um, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to Blackfoot Territory. I'm sitting at the very southern end of the Blood Reserve, uh, which is part of the Blackfoot Confederacy. That includes on the Canadian side, Siksika, which is east of Calgary, uh, Bigani, which is around Pincher Creek, um, Kainai, Organa, 
And then the largest tribe of us is on the uh, Montana side, which is a Blackfeet um, tribe in Montana. So welcome to um, this area. Also, I would like to um, acknowledge the uh, new forged urban Indigenous communities in Lethbridge and some of our smaller places in the Métis Nation of Alberta. Thank you very much for inviting me today, everyone. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint. I thought maybe I could just take it story-wise. Um, I know it, uh, the lunch hour can go very fast. So I just want to present what's happened to Blood Reserve over uh, the period of time starting in 2014 when we started noticing um, a greater number of um, overdose deaths and um, I don't know if anybody's heard my um, my talk before, um, but the initial, the very first fentanyl overdose that I did experience was in the parking lot at Walmart, and it was a very young uh, man uh, from one of our Confederacy reserves. He was in his early 20s. Um, I pulled into the Mark, uh, Walmart parking lot, and there were three children in the vehicle, and I heard them screaming. When I turned the car off, I looked, and I saw the the individual fallout of his vehicle and when I went to go check he wasn't breathing and he had no heartbeat and for a young individual um, in the young 20s that's you know it's hard to determine what would cause that other than an overdose um, luckily um, his life was saved and after that incident we began to see more and more overdoses um, many of them we were not certain what the um, what the substance was and so we finally added fentanyl to our our talk screens within the emergency rooms and lo and behold fentanyl was in every one of the the um uh the overdoses uh so we did mobilize blood reserve and we started talking about harm reduction and um we had some very good help from at that time it was lethbridge hiv and um, stacy burke and the team that worked there suggested that we um, that we start um, naloxone, teaching our people on the reserve how to use naloxone and save lives. Nowhere else in Alberta did they do that except in Edmonton with Streets Alive, where they taught lay people how to use life-saving um, drugs in naloxone. So um, we did, uh, Stacy and her team went to BC. They learned a program called um, uh, no, I can't remember. It's like teach the. Um, um, <laughs> it's been a while, but it's like teach the teach teach people, and then they will teach others. So, anyway, they went and learned the program. They brought brought it to Blood Reserve. We did a reserve wide blitz in a lot of our communities and distributed naloxone, which was unheard of at the time. And Health Canada um, was very helpful, or um, a couple of the doctors from Health Canada. But when it was heard in Ottawa that um, that we were using naloxone by lay people, it was stopped, and the individuals were um, were basically punished for for the work that they did on harm reduction. Later on, our chief did write a letter and say it's very important that we save lives here, um, and we were able to start um, with uh, the legal process of harm reduction on our reserve. So in March of 2015, we had experienced up to um, 20 deaths from fentanyl overdose and mixed overdose. And when people started using naloxone, for three months we had zero deaths. So we empowered our people to be able to save lives and recognize that they could save a loved one within their home. So we began to work on a continuum of care to address the um, the addictions within our community. One of the best things that we could have done was that we made a trip to Vancouver to visit the Portland Housing Society, um, the downtown east side, and as you see in um, Elamaya's movie, um, we brought a, a group of women there to learn about harm reduction, about um, safe consumption, about something called in, in talks, and, um, um, insight, sorry, and offsite. And all, I mean, uh, yeah, insight, offsite, and then there was things like spikes on bikes, where you see a segment there where there are individuals who have naloxone in their fanny packs and all of the life saving um, and harm reduction equipment, and they bicycle around the downtown east side and save lives. 
So there are very many um, uh, life-saving measures um, that are taken in, in Vancouver in the downtown east side. So we brought some of our learnings back. Um, we started uh, opiate replacement therapy, which is now well accepted all across Canada. We started with, with um, uh, buprenorphine, naloxone, um, oral um, ingestion, which required a triplicate prescription and was very controlled. Uh, there were very few of uh, um, our family physicians or our doctors who were prescribing at the time. So it was quite it was quite exciting, but also a very heavy load when there are very few physicians who prescribe um, um, Suboxone. We then added methadone, and um, and we do have methadone prescribers now in our clinic. We actually have a an addictions clinic, walk-in clinic every Wednesday. We went on to start talking about treatment, and it's very important to understand that at the time, all of our or a lot of our people were overdosing. The um, Alberta Health Services opened up many sites or spots for our people across the province and welcomed us into the treatment centres. But most of the treatment centres that we sent our people to were abstinence-based treatment, and they were not um, withdrawn enough. Uh, they were still sick when they arrived at the abstinence-based treatment centres, and as a re result, many of them didn't finish the, um, the course of the abstinence-based treatment. Many returned to the reserve and used at their at the dose they were using or the amount they thought they were using when they left. As a result, we had more deaths and um, more overdoses. Um, so we recognize that abstinence-based treatment did not work for our people. So we have to start working on um, on uh, more humane ways of helping people to withdraw and and also to be treated so that they. They don't feel like failures when they go through abstinence-based treatment. They do feel like failures, and in in uh, Maya's movie, you will see that um, that happens a lot. There, there's a lot of falls along the way, and um, recovery is never from A to B to C to D. It's often A to B and then back to A again. So we're recognizing that we need to support them and and not make them feel like failures in their in their recovery. Um, the most significant and exciting thing that I think we have done um, on our journey is to develop a detox center. It's called Bringing the Spirits Home, and it's um, medical detox, and we partnered with the EMS paramedics on the blood reserve. We built our program. Uh, we were supported previously by the NDP government, um, Sarah Hoffman, who took a chance on us and gave us our initial grant to open our um, detox. And it was initially for eight people and grew to 21 people. And um, the, the, um, the current government also supported us uh, with funding for our, our treat, I mean, for our detox. So instead of our people going to emergency rooms when they overdose, the ambulance diverts them straight to detox. We have an observation room where we, we allow or we have um, fluids, so they're resuscitated with IV fluids. Um, we give mild sedation, usually Ativan, or if they're really having a tough time, um, stronger sedation so they can get through the first 12 to 24 hours uh, without going through the nightmare of all of the symptoms of withdrawal. So when they start feeling better and they're able to eat and they're able to sleep um, and we're able to initiate opiate replacement therapy, then we do and we invite them to stay, and we try to keep them there until they get into treatment. Um, and therefore, they don't they don't have the opportunity to relapse um, from the detox that they've done. Um, and some people will stay, um, you know, somewhere from three weeks to three months to six months, you know, to get them into the appropriate um, treatment facility in Alberta. Um, and on on reserve, we have the Kainai Healing Lodge. Um, some of the really good things that have happened at the um, at our detox is that we don't separate. Um, when a woman comes in pregnant, we support her through her pregnancy. We try to decrease. We try to make them comfortable first, get them through their initial withdrawal, get them stabilized on other on either Suboxone or Methadone, 
and um, supportive medication for any other substances that they're um, withdrawing from. And then we try to decrease the, um, the suboxone or methadone to a reasonable amount so that when they go in to deliver the baby, that the baby does not go through severe withdrawal and it's called neonatal abstinence syndrome. So by doing this, and, and one of our staff members will accompany um, the, the um, mother to her delivery, so always there is somebody supervising or helping and supporting the mom. So we prevent, um, we prevent the, um, the apprehension of the baby by child welfare. We try to um, keep the bond between mom and baby stable, and we return them back to the detox center as, um, as, a, as a unit, a mom and baby unit. And so we've had um, four successful um, interventions like that, where the mothers have now gone on to have their own home, never lost custody of their baby, and are putting their lives back together. So I think the baby that you see me holding is one of those babies that that um, stayed with mother, and mother was able to keep her her children. So these are some of the things that we've done with our continuum of care. You might ask why this and how this happened. So most of us were quite shocked and um, and um, and couldn't understand the 215 children uh, or or the remains of the 215 children in Kamloops. And why I'm saying that is because one of the most traumatic, um, long, um, long happening events to Indigenous people across the um, country was residential school. And uh, we know, and if you if you're if you've heard Gabor Mate give his um, talks, you know that trauma is a major part of addiction. And when you take a look at residential school and you start um, counting the number of, or the, um, the type of trauma that children have had. Um, there is, a, also I want to stop there and say that there is a, um, a study that was done by Kaiser Permanente, it's a, um, an HMO in the States, and they tried to figure out um, chronic disease and what was the association between chronic d disease and childhood trauma. And they came up with what's called an ACEs score, adverse childhood event score so for everything that a child has um, experienced whether it be um, physical abuse emotional abuse sexual abuse um, um, abandonment um, you know a number of, of uh, child I mean adverse events um, many of the children that went to residential school received almost all of those adverse childhood events and um, as a result, many of those who are survivors um, actually ha have high rates of addictions. Um, so we know that adverse childhood events and the trauma in residential school does affect Indigenous people across the country. And that's one of the reasons why we're seeing such high rates of, um, of addictions, especially now. Um, poverty is the second biggest one. And I know in Saskatoon, Leemstra and Newdorf did a study on um, on poverty within neighborhoods, and they and they were able to distinguish that the neighborhoods, the lower and lowest income neighborhoods, are the ones with the highest prevalence of chronic disease and addictions. Um, and we know that, that historic Canadian policy has put Indigenous uh, First Nations communities and Métis communities in a situation where um, they're in. Um, abject poverty, and it's very difficult to even address housing situations. And finally, the social determinants um, of health, and one of the ones that we see today, which is pretty significant in this um, south zone of Alberta, is racism and how people are treated and how um, difficult it is to get the services they need to address the addictions that they have. Um, so I don't want to make this completely um, um, a talk about victimization. I want to let you know that there is resilience within the people here. And um, as we speak, um, Blood Reserve has reignited its task force. And so at that table on Tuesdays and Thursdays, after everybody's work is done, we sit down and start strategies to help our people. So um, 
it's policing, it's um, uh, social uh, um, development, it's child welfare, it's um, detox, it's EMS. So we all sit down together and try to figure out the best way to address situations and come up with uh, a strategy. And it's wonderful to see the people around that table who are working hard within the community to address a community issue. Um, I think I'm going to leave it at that. Um, and I think what we wanted to do was have some discussion. So I'm going to open it up to discussion. And if Annalise, you want to lead the discussion. Yeah. Excellent. Um, actually, if I'm going to exercise my moderator privileges and ask the first question. Um, you mentioned that all the um, spaces are um, are dry or or are you know you have that abstinence spaces. What would a space look like if it wasn't? Um, what what would that look like? How would people be supported there? Well, I think that one is the expectation, and, and it's in um, Elamaya's film, but the expectation is that somebody goes from, um, you know, going, using heavily or being heavily addicted to becoming co completely clean and sober. And, you know, that would be one of the old expectations um, and something that we, we used to um, dwell on, and that's the 12-step program. And and expecting complete abstinence, which is the, the the goal. That would be like the golden the golden rule or the golden place is to be completely abstinent and happy. But through our experience, we know that many people cannot go from A to D and walk out and be completely healthy. We know um, through experience, especially with the detox, that people may try two or three times before they actually really um, begin to to heal and they do need lots of support family family support or um, a partner who is you know very supportive um, so we know that the abstinence-based treatment has very high expectations of people and you know one of the one of the things that's very human is the feeling of failure when you cannot um, you cannot achieve what other people expect of you uh, and so I think it's very important that our, our treatment centers address abstinence-based treatment and that it actually can be harmful in some ways by the expectations that they're, that they're giving to people that they will leave these places completely clean and sober and their lives will be great. It doesn't happen that way, and we're finding that out. It feels more like a fairy tale that from A to D, right? Yeah. Um, yes, that's true. Yeah, our our question next question is from Knut Peterson. Thank you very much, Esther, for speaking to Sapa on very short notice. Can you please describe more details on how you were affected on the blood reserve when the SCC in Lethbridge was closed when uh, Arches was closed? Uh, we were heavily affected. Um, uh, and of course, COVID happened just shortly there, um, thereabout. Um, one is um, there were no safe places for our people to be. So our membership, we lost 91 people more than what we did in the beginning of this crisis. And many of them were found in back alleys, behind houses, or in basements alone. And so we we had a very high mortality rate as a result of the closure of the safe consumption site, or the um, uh, yeah of the safe consumption site or SCS. And also, there was a really ugly period for our people where there was what I call social pornography. And on YouTube, there were many people who were posting videos of our people in in struggle. Um, many who were in the throes of of you know being in a in really rough shape and they were being posted on youtube and you and youtube was sharing pictures of somebody in you know in a in a sick very sick state with no help and um and this became a very racist um event and um our people are still reeling from that um the um, racism has only grown and in lethbridge and gotten worse it has not gotten better 
and you will hear many of our people will not go to the emergency rooms. They will not go to the clinics. In fact, there are no openings for a lot of our homeless people in the inner city of Lethbridge um, to have a primary care physician. They just are not allowed into the clinics or they or the clinics are not accepting new patients, but especially not patients with so many um so many difficulties. So it has impacted us heavily in two ways. One is mortality and the other is we're dealing with a greater issue of racism than we ever had before. Um, our next question comes from Tim Timothy from the Leftbridge Herald, reporter from the Leftbridge Herald. Last week, Elder Rogers Prairie Chicken said that true that the true extent of the overdose problem on the blood reserve is being underreported, if anything, according to the statistics he compiled. Your thoughts on that, please. Oh, I have good thoughts on that one. I'm very angry about that post that was made in the Lethbridge Herald. I was not called by Timothy or anybody else to um, to corroborate the um, the claims that were made. I think that those individuals in a time of pain were taken advantage of, and I call the social porn. We were centerfold and front page for Lethbridge Herald, and there was no corroboration for that story. I was not called. I was told I would be arrested if I went to that site to make a statement. I would like to say that our people have worked hard on a, on a strategy to overcome what is coming on. I did not see any verification of the numbers that the Lethbridge Herald posted. I think it's very shameful of you, Tim, to have done that without corroborating the story with other people on the reserve who are working very hard. In fact, that story has divided our community and we are now working with that pain. Our next question comes from Laurie Schultz. Would you comment further on the treatment options available to your community? Must residents leave? What are the gaps? And finally, what treatment model what treatment model would you believe to be effective? I think that the um, harm reduction treatment model is probably the most effective way of, of dealing with people. I think that uh, wraparound supports are very important, including housing um, alternatives. Um, and for people to recognize that um, addictions are not, um, like I said, they're not from A to D. And I think that we need to be have more trauma-informed care in the work we do with all people with addictions, not just Indigenous um, people with addictions. We recognize that many um, children and many people who are um, dealing with addictions have had many really difficult events in their lives. And perhaps we need to look at those within our treatment alternatives as well. Our next question comes from Ian Hurdle. What are, sorry, I'll start again. We are almost a generation since the last residential school closed. As time goes on, do you think this distance will help the next generation? Um, I think it will. I think what we have to do is understand. We need to understand where this is coming from. Um, I think the the um, the blaming the victim it has got to stop. I mean, it's not it's not going to change the way um, people are. And I think one of the things that we must understand too is something that's called return on investment. And I hear that a lot within Alberta Health Services. And that is what good we do and how we strategize on the front end of a problem will result in the return in investment. That means we're hoping to see less people going to the emergency room. We're hoping to see less burden on the ambulance and police, less burden on the community in terms of the crime rate. So if we address this properly, I think that we will see a return in investment and hopefully within the next 10 years, but it won't happen until we address this the way it needs to be addressed. And part of it is listening to the people with addictions and um, lived experience. I would like to ask another question, Esther, if that's okay. Um, 
What about um, this this new scientific thought about genetic trauma, trauma that is genetically inherent? Um, how does that? Do you have any thoughts on that? I know the University of Lethbridge is looking into that right now. Um, I'm just curious if you knew more about it and could share that with us. Yeah, I think um, uh, the the study of epigenetics is very important. Um, I know that there was a, a wonderful um, physician, Dr. Um, um, I think his name was um, um, Dr. Mustar, Mustard. Um, who did study childhood um, trauma. I think he went to Cuba and did a lot of work in Cuba in terms of how how early childhood was and also on epigenetics and how the environment um, that an infant um, or a fetus is, is like the environment that the fetus is in does help to um, or it does affect how certain genes are um, are expressed. And so I think that when a mother is stressed, when she's hungry, when she's afraid, if she's been, um, you know, if she's been, uh, assaulted, um, there's so many things that affect the hormones of the mom, which may be in affecting the, the development or the expression of, um, of genes within, the, um, within the fetus or the infant. And um, my mother used to say to me, and I used to, um, I used to think it was crazy, but she said to me, um, when a child was born with a birthmark in a certain place, she would say, well, the mother, the mother has been hit or the mother has been hurt, and it's coming out in the, in the, um, in the, the birthmark that the child has. And I mean, it literally maybe is not that way, but um, but it is um, metaphorically the same thing, I think. Our um, next question comes from Mark Goodall. Do you think that decriminalization of illicit drugs is a good idea? Would this help or exasperate the situation? Um, I think in our situation here on Blood Reserve, um, what we understand is that there was a market that was built on prescription drugs and illicit um, alcohol. Um, our reserve is um, is still under the Indian Act. We're still a dry reserve, which means that we cannot have um, we cannot legally sell or have liquor on the reserve. As a result, people will will buy. And in the town of Cardston, there is no liquor store, and there is no um, there is no legal place to buy alcohol in Cardston. So many of the people who are alcoholics or addicted to alcohol will buy hairspray and um, mouthwash, which is very damaging. And you'll see that in Maya's film as well. That. We really need to look at um, managed alcohol programs, um, which would help reduce head injuries and GI bleeds and cirrhosis. Um, and that's uh, with regard to alcohol. With regard to drugs um, and illicit drugs, we know that there was an illicit prescription drug market prior to the um, prior to the um, entry of fentanyl. And so, what happened is, people in poverty. Even grandmothers um, uh, many times would give their prescription drugs, which were Tylenol 3s or other opiate prescription drugs, to family members to sell so they could buy groceries. So out of poverty was a market that grew, um, uh, a black market for prescription drugs. And we know that when, um, when um, Neo Oxy came out, um, there was a period that people were not able to get legal prescription drugs and not use it in the ways progressed to um, to uh, injection or snorting. And as soon as fentanyl arrived on the on the scene, um, fentanyl replaced and was one of the, I would say, one of the commodities that this drug market had already had, or these dealers already had. They just plugged in fentanyl and they made lots more money. And there were lots of deaths. So um, I think that um, a very um, um, a very 
supervised and controlled um, safe drug supply would help decriminalize um, uh, drugs. I mean, de decriminalized drugs would help because we would see less um, harm to the individual, as we know the um, and we're seeing now is a, a broader use of street drugs. So it initiated with Tylenol threes. It grew to other things, and then fentanyl. And now we are treating fentanyl, um, carfentanyl, heroin, and um, crystal meth. And as we know, meth is not um, does not have have a replacement. So we have to use supportive medication. So it's only getting worse. The, the amount of poisons that are within the, um, in the, the marketable um, commodity is, um, is changing and it's worse. We're seeing benzodiazepines as well, which cannot be reversed on the scene. So even though they have naloxone on the scene, we're still, they're still not able to revive people with, um, with the other substances in that. So um, Portugal Portugal has done a very good job of, um, of safe supply, and um, I really think that in order to decrease the criminal element and, um, and safely bring people to the possibility of going to detox, um, the possibility of getting into treatment, is to make it safer for them and, and make it easier for them to get the help they need. Our next question comes from Laurie Schultz. Is your community continuing to collaborate with other agencies such as the HIV Lethbridge Group or others? Uh, yes, we're, we're reaching out to work with the urban indigenous groups. We work now with um, the um, indigenous um, recovery coaches program. Uh, we work with Mark Brave Rock with the um, with the Sage Clan, and um, we were working with the Friendship Center. I think they're in transition, so we work with the Friendship Center as well, reaching out to those people who are our members but live in Lethbridge and supporting other Indigenous uh, members. And then there are many ally ally groups. I think that we will work with, but. Um, Initially, we're working with um, what's going on in our community, and then we're working out from there. Our next question uh, is from um, Claude Peterson. Brian Culp, let me just turn this off. Sorry about that. Um, Brian Culp at the University of Lethbridge did a lot of work on generational trauma question at this point which level of government are you are or can be most helpful provincially or federally um i think that um thank you um brian for that for that question and um thank you for being my professor in pre-med um but the, the, the question was yes. from Clint peterson sorry Oh, it was from Knut. Yeah. Okay, so Knut, yes, Brian Kolb's done a, a lot of work on inter, intergenerational trauma. I think um, I think we have to go to all levels of government and all levels of community. I think that we need to educate as many people as possible on what what the problem really is and where can we strategize in terms of projects. Um, you know which government has what uh, what responsibilities. So, you know, um, and and I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon because um, I think it's very important that we work together in in understanding this problem. But um, things like if the project is a federal project for housing, then we need to um, we need to uh, you know uh, apply for those projects from the federal government. If the project is um, addictions and mental health within um, the Alberta government or AHS or any of um, any of the nonprofit societies that also um, have programs and projects, I think we need to address or we need to um, we need to uh, propose strategies to them as well so that we can all be involved in um, in a in a collaborative strategy. Um, to address, you know, number one, trauma, number two, poverty and social determinants. And 
one of the biggest um, problems right now is housing. We have a growing population of homeless people, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. And housing alternatives, you know, I think beyond the, um, the three-bedroom bungalow, there's a lot of alternatives for, um, for supporting people who need to get into homes. Thanks. Our next question comes from uh, Mary Claire Greenshields. Thank you for sharing your knowledge, Dr. Tilfeathers. Dr. Mate's most recent film suggests that we must approach trauma with willingness to be vulnerable and compassionate. Any idea, any ideas how we can encourage this? Um, I think one, um, uh, I'm just writing that down. I love um, Dr. Mate's um, thinking and the work that he's done. He's helped a lot of people. Um, but it's very difficult for Indigenous people to become vulnerable when they're taken advantage of, like the Lethbridge Herald did to a number of individuals in a very, very difficult time. So I'd like to warn people that most Indigenous people are afraid to be vulnerable in front of non-Indigenous because they're afraid that it gives a platform for racism and they, it gives a platform to drive that whole um, stigma home about how Indigenous people are not equal to non-Indigenous people. So uh, I caution you to be very, very careful about the vulnerabilities that, um, that people show and show kindness and compassion back to the vulnerability rather than, um, than driving, um, driving the point home that, we, that Indigenous people are not equal and, um, and are victims of their own, um, on their own accord. Um, our next question is from Laurie Schultz. What measures would you like to see established to deal with contributing factors such as poverty, etc.? I think that um, I think that the Canadian population doesn't understand that, um, and I'm I'm not aiming this at you, Laurie, but um, that the Canadian population does not understand that there are. Um, policies under the Indian Act, um, which do not allow us even to have mortgages on the reserve. Uh, they do not allow, um, you know, at one time uh, with the, within the blood reserve, there was a paper that was written by uh, um, uh, R.N. Wilson that said we were not able to buy or sell hay. We were not able to buy or sell cows or horses without Ottawa's permission. As a result, one winter, most of our cattle froze because Ottawa did not, um, you know, they did not okay it, and it took forever to get there by train. By the time the the request got to Ottawa, the cattle were already dead. So it's a it's a historical um, policy that we and we need to look at those policies that um, that cause poverty. One of them being housing. You know, the housing policies of not being able to get a mortgage have created the situation that we have today, and that is um, people unable to to buy their own homes on reserve and be uh, reliant on a government housing program. Um, many things. I I applaud what's happening with a lot of our in our educational institutions in Alberta because they are uplifting the education of Indigenous people within. Um, U of A, U of C, U of L, and many of our community colleges. And I think that is the right move to take. Our next question, sorry, I'm lost in the thread here. Our next question is um, from Mary Shillington. As a retired social worker, I'm wondering how you and other professionals are working at keeping yourself positive when there are so many issues you're trying to deal with? Um, uh, that's a difficult question to answer because we're always on the go in terms of trying to strategize and help people within the community. And I think it's probably being part of a communal um, culture where you know that one action that you take may affect 10 other people in the community and as difficult as it is to continue with the energy and the giving that needs to be done there is only one way to beat the inequities that we that we face today and that is to work even harder and so many of our frontline workers are very tired 
but we recognize that um, the need is there for us to do that. So when COVID is over, I'm sure many people will be really happy to, to take a break. And <clears throat> when we start to see our numbers decrease in terms of overdoses and, um, and the morbidity as well as the mortality, I think then we can start taking a break. Our next question comes from Laura Schultz. What actions can the Southern Alberta community as a whole and individuals take towards a solution? Um, I, I think that I think the main thing is to understand what is colonialism and what is um, settlerism. Um, I think we all need to understand that we are all treaty people. We may not have all signed that treaty, but there were parties to that treaty which were um, the Indigenous uh, and treaty people and the, um, and the settlers. And we all have a responsibility to, um, to maintain the peace and to recognize each other as equals, uh, not unequal. And um, I think one of the things that we really have to work on right now is addressing racism in, um, in Southern Alberta because it affects people's housing People cannot get into apartments or homes. It affects employment. It affects education. It affects childcare. Racism affects every avenue of an Indigenous person's life. We got an argue. We got Timothy from the Lethbridge Herald who argues that he would like to clarify the Herald was called by organizers of the event who are indigenous elders and we did reach out to the blood tribe department of health we got no comment well um tim you were involved in a situation where uh there should be privacy for the employer and the um and the employed this is not any business of the lethbridge herald this is the business of the employer and the person who um who was employed, and by doing what you did, you drove a wedge into the community. And I would, a responsible journalist would look out for the well being of the person that you are interviewing and make sure that they are safe. Many of those people are now in an unsafe, unsafe place because of the irresponsible reporting that you did. I did not receive a call. I was told that I would get arrested if I came down to, um, to speak to the press. So were many of the people from B Blood Tribe Department of Health. So really, if you are a responsible journalist, you would have saw this situation and you would have got and waited and thought about the well-being of the person, the people that you exposed. Very wrong. Our next question comes from Ian Hurdle. If the funding that the Supreme Court said was not given to Indigenous community was supplied, how much would this help? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah. Um, if the funding that the Supreme Court said was not given to Indigenous communities was in fact supplied, how much would that have helped? Um, in terms of safe supply or in terms of treatment and, um, and detox? Ian, could you clarify that? Uh, could you please clarify your question further? What funding are you um, addressing here when you're saying the Supreme Court? Um, we'll just, um, yeah, so we'll just wait for Ian's question. Well, um, there's no other questions in the queue, so um, I'm just curious. What would be, like, in terms of um, your, your best case scenario, what would be, what would be your, ah, Ian, Ian just answered, welfare and health. So let's go with that. So I, I'll read that question out again. If the funding that the Supreme Court said was not given to the Indigenous community was supplied, and he says welfare and health, how much would this have helped? Um, in, in the 1800s, it probably would have helped a lot. 
but I think the framing of um, the framing of funding and the narrative that is taken in funding in, that is um, that is uh, supportive of Indigenous populations needs to be um, framed in terms of number one, welfare is probably one of the most damaging things to Indigenous people across the country um, because we came we became more dependent. So the framing of that should be employment um, initiatives, um, you know, housing initiatives, initiatives that are not um, just welfare. And, and I understand that you meant well by that, um, Ian, but I think that we really need to take a look at what does that funding, what is the narrative of that funding? Is that funding supportive in terms of, um, of people becoming independent or rather dependent? So one of the greatest damages to our people was welfare and it's really really hard to get away from dependency thinking and so definitely health would have been one and also the provincial governments working with the federal governments to lift jurisdictional barriers for ho uh, hospitals detox um, many of the services that are provided by alberta um, sometimes they're um, they're replicated by the federal government on reserve. So sometimes we have dual programs going in certain places, but no programs going or no uh, services going. So for the, um, the detox, uh, because of the way that the constitution is written, detox cannot be built on reserve and they cannot be um, supported by federal government. And so um, Sarah Hoffman took a big, chance in terms of supporting us with a detox because the provincial government is not to fund detox on reserve and neither does the federal government so the chance they took has really helped and so we need to look at lifting some jurisdictional barriers when it comes to health care our next question comes from Clint Peterson are you optimistic that present educational opportunities for indigenous youth in its present form both K to 12 and post-secondary is adequate or just a good start? I think it's getting better. Um, number one, I want to say that it's very, very important that we keep um, residential schools and the harm of residential schools in our educational curriculum so everybody understands uh, the damage that, um, that uh, residential schools does to human beings. Um, so that's very important, but I'm very optimistic about education itself. Um, I just uh, read yesterday that we have um, an eighth um, student going into medicine from the blood reserve. So when she's done, we will have graduated eight doctors from our community. And I'm seeing um, posts all across Facebook of all of the young people who are graduating and they're more aware of what really needs to be done for their communities and how they can contribute to not only their communities but to changing the Canadian um, the Canadian picture. So I'm very op optimistic about education. Which brings us into uh, Laurie Schultz's question. Could you discuss methods and models of educating non-Indigenous people as to history and truth and reconciliation? Um, I think that one is we need to start as young as we can, um, you know, with a shared curriculum on, you know, what is a reserve? My sister uh, is a teacher here in Cardston and she's teaching um, eighth grade and none of the Indigenous, non-Indigenous students in her class know what a reserve is. They do not know which reserve they're located next to. They do not know what a treaty is and they've never heard of residential school. I was shocked. So I think that we need to start as early as possible in educating um, non-Indigenous people on the history of Canada and the history of Indigenous people. I think that will help in the understanding and um, and the lights that go off in children's minds on how you know they can they can um, contribute because children are very very innovative. But um, through every, every step of the way, truth and reconciliation means first truths. Um, I really see that media, certain media can carry the stigma of racism and continue to, um, to take a hammer and hit Indigenous people over the head with the same stigma 
which which um, helps to um, to lift racism and continue to propagate the um, the um, stigmas that many Canadians have about Indigenous people and other races. So media, I think, is to blame for continuing um, to propagate the stigma. Um, and they really need to question the narrative they have when they talk about Indigenous people. Is it from a narrative of strength or a narrative of victimization? And do they continue to victimize? Um, and so I think that truth needs to be told from a narrative that people understand and not a continuous narrative of, oh, they're, you know, not smart enough, they're not good enough, you know, they did this to themselves. So the truth really needs to be told. And I think over the um, next few months, we will be hearing about more and more graves that are found and, and we will understand more and more of what, you know, horror many children went through and why many people have addictions. Um, reconciliation, I think, means allies listening, learning, and then and supporting. I think the return on investment of truth and truth and reconciliation, hopefully in the next ten to twenty years, shows that we'll have a less burdened healthcare system, and um, you know, and people will be happy about happier about um, the outcomes that we're seeing. Thank you so much, Esther, for your time today. Um, I would like to, to uh, read out a couple of thank yous that are in the queue. Uh, Laurie Schultz, Dr. Till Fetters, heartfelt thank you for your time and presentation this afternoon. Um, Mary Claire Greenshields, thank you so much. Amazing presentation. Ian Hurdle, nice to see Maya all grown up. <laughs> um, Knut Peterson, much appreciated, Esther, that you took time out of your busy day to talk here. And on behalf of SACPA, we very much appreciate your time. Um, and on this very emotional topic, um, would you, before we, before we end the session today, could you give us a take home message? I think your last question already on truth and reconciliation was very powerful. Your whole talk's been very powerful. But do you have a take home message for us today? Um, I think that um, I'm very thankful for this um, opportunity to speak to you and the platform to to help teach what's really happening here. Um, but I'm very optimistic that the more we have these kind of um, discussions, the better things will get for all of us. And um, and talking sometimes is is difficult and. Um, and sometimes it's awkward and it's sometimes it's painful, but I think we're going to get to another, another place. And, um, I, I really see that with these, this kind of work that you're doing, that, um, we will lift all of us to a different place. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And for, for our viewers, please join us on Thursday. An Educator's Perspective on Alberta's Proposed Draft Curriculum with Cam Rogers and Kelly Freewin. And also join us again on Monday, uh, June 21st, for a special session with Keith Moon, uh, The Deadly Effects of Residential Schools in Canada, What Can We Do Now? So we look forward to you joining in then. Okay. Thank you.